Hi folks, welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. The purpose of this video is to uh, introduce you to the concept of centripetal acceleration. We're going to talk both conceptually what it means and how it's calculated. So what we're looking at here, I've got a picture of this car here. And imagine that this car is driving around the circular path here of radius r. And we're going to imagine this example that the speed of the car is constant. So I'm going to write this down. Now speed, remember, is the magnitude of your velocity. Oops, I'm going to do that in black. All right, so magnitude of your velocity, constant. So this car is not speeding up or slowing down. It's just driving along this curve at constant uh, speed. And there's a couple snapshots in time I want to kind of take a look at. We're going to take a look at this snapshot in time this snapshot in time, and this snapshot in time. Now, to tell you the truth, it's the first one, this one and this one that I really want to focus on. So I'm going to go ahead and draw velocity vectors at these two snapshots in time here. So, <clears throat> let's see, the velocity vector for this car at this instant in time is pointing something maybe like this. V. And the velocity vector at this point in time is pointing maybe something like this. And the important thing to realize is the magnitude of these velocity vectors would be the same. Now, let's talk about acceleration. Remember that acceleration is a vector quantity it's equal to delta v over delta t. So acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Now at first glance we might decide, oh, well our acceleration is constant because this is moving at constant speed. But you have to remember that velocity is a vector quantity. It has direction and if you change either one, magnitude or direction, you are in fact accelerating. This car, this velocity vector is changing in direction. All right, so we can actually calculate an acceleration for this car. In order to do that, however, what we need to do is we need to kind of look at the geometry, and these velocity vectors need to be broken into components. So I'm going to go ahead and do this here. Let's see. Okay, so we got that distance. this distance. Now, this interior angle here, for reasons that will that'll be clear in a minute, I'm going to call that 2 theta. And <clears throat> you'll see why I call it 2 theta here in just a second. So now if we draw like a vertical line here, right? and now I draw a horizontal line, here, here's what I'd like to point out. If this is 2 theta, that makes this angle theta. That makes this angle 90 minus theta. That makes this angle right here theta. Over here, if I extend this line a little further, that angle also is theta because, you know, this one right here is 90 minus theta. That's a 90. That ends up being theta. So we Theta is the angle now between the velocity vector and this horizontal line. And that's true whether or not we're talking about this picture and this picture. Now, I had intended this to be pretty much a perfectly symmetrical example. Yeah, you know, you notice it's kind of off a little tiny bit. That's because I just kind of put it together uh, by hand here. So imagine here that these are like perfect symmetrical triangles. Now, these two velocity vectors can now be broken into components. And I'm going to go ahead and draw their components in red. So this guy right here has an x component that points this way and a y component that points this way. Remember that components themselves have directions. <clears throat> this guy right here is equal to v sine theta. This guy is equal to v cosine theta, but I'm not even going to write it because we're not going to need that. I'll explain why here in a minute. All right, now I'm going to take a look at the the velocity components of the other car, the other car's velocity vector. So when we take this velocity vector and we break it into components, we've got an x component that might point something like this, and a y component that points something like this. And again, the y component here opposite the angle 
theta, so this thing's magnitude is V sine theta, but it points down. Now, my picture is not perfectly to scale. A thing to realize is that if the V's are the same, the thetas are the same, the V cosine theta and this V cosine theta, these are of the same length. There's no real change in velocity as far as the X direction is concerned. But look at the Y direction. The initial velocity Y components V sine theta up, it went to V sine theta down. That's a fairly significant change there. So what we can do now is we can start calculating the acceleration. All right, delta V over delta T, that's V final minus V initial. And I'm just going to worry now about Y components. So that's going to be minus V sine theta. That's the final velocity Y direction. Minus the initial velocity Y direction, which is V sine theta. And then over delta T. Now, these are like terms. Minus V sine theta minus another V sine theta is minus 2 V sine theta. Now, direction, we were doing the y direction, oops, I forgot my minus sign, we're getting negative values. So in other words, the acceleration is equal to 2v sine theta over delta t, and it's down. Now, let's talk a little bit about this delta t. The delta t we can get from the concept, concept of arc length. <clears throat> I'm going to do this in blue. The car moves from here along this... Uh, circular or circular path to that distance right there. I'm going to call that distance S. And S is related to my angle here through the concept of the radian. S is equal to R times this interior angle here, which is 2 theta. Speed, your V, is distance over time. And the distance this car moved is this distance s, which we can write as r times 2 theta. I'm going to go ahead and just write that 2r theta and then over time. All right. So the time I can solve from this, and I'm just I'm going to call that a delta t here now because that's what it's called up here. If I solve this for the delta t, we get 2r times theta over v. Now anywhere we see a t, we can put this expression. So I'm going to go ahead sub that quantity, whoops, here, whoops, here, <laughs> and rewrite this. So now what we're going to get is the acceleration is equal to 2v sine theta over the delta t, which we can write as 2r theta over v. Now I know the direction's down, I'm not worried about that, I'm going to just leave that off for now. I'm going to clean this up just a tiny little bit. So this is equal to, let's see, you'll notice these cancel. If I, if I divide by r over v, we end up with v squared over r sine theta over theta. Now, at this point, uh, if you're familiar with calculus and limits and things like that, that's fine. You know, from a calculus class, we know that the limit as, uh, let's say, theta goes to 0 of sine theta over theta is equal to 1. If you're familiar with that limit, that's perfectly fine. But if not, <clears throat> you can do this with your calculator. Uh, if you try, if we if we look at this ratio and you put in a value, you look at, say, 0.1 for theta and sine of 0.1, and you try the ratio, you're going to get something pretty darn close to 1. Or try 0.01 and sine of 0.01 and try the ratio of these two. You're going to get something very close to 1. What that means here is this. If we imagine a small time, like we imagine our delta t getting smaller and smaller and smaller, these two positions would, would both get closer and closer and closer to this position right here. And our answer is basically converging to or giving us the acceleration at that instant in time. If we do that, you know, if we imagine our delta t getting smaller, this car is converging to here, this car is moving over to here, these thetas are going to zero. And they're going to zero at the same time as the sine theta. So anyway, long story short, when theta is very, very small, sine theta over theta is approximately one. So this term right here goes to one, and our acceleration goes to this value, v squared over r, and we know it's in this direction. Now that's just because of where I chose to do the picture. Had I did the same picture over here, we would have ended up with an acceleration vector that pointed this way. 
here we ended up with the acceleration vector pointed this way. If I did the same example over here, we'd end up with an acceleration vector pointed this way. So this acceleration has a special name. It's called centripetal acceleration, not centrifugal acceleration. In, in fact, uh, there is, there's no such thing as a centrifugal acceleration. If you're in class, I'll talk about why, or maybe I'll make another video about that. But centripetal acceleration is a real acceleration. This thing does exist. Uh, centripetal means center seeking. It's, I like to think of it like this. It's the acceleration you get because of changes in your velocity direction. You're going to get a centripetal acceleration anytime your velocity is changing direction. Typically, like in a college physics class, that will be a circular motion type problem. This is how centripetal acceleration is calculated, v squared over r. And it's always directed towards the center of curvature. You'll notice in this picture, like at this instant, the centripetal acceleration points left. Here it points down. Here it would point right. If this car was moving along this path, at this instant it would point this way. At this instant it points this way. Right here it points this way, and so forth. So, you know, what I think is really important about centripetal acceleration is recognizing when you have a centripetal acceleration. Right. Anytime your velocity vector is changing in direction. Uh, two, knowing how to calculate. It's equal to v squared over r. Three, knowing its direction. It's always directed towards the center of curvature. So I think that's probably enough on this video. I think that's enough about centripetal acceleration for now. Uh, I'll make some examples of this. And uh, everybody have a great day.